All right, guys, how are you doing? Good, good. So, you know, to be quite honest with you, when uh, I originally got an invitation to, to come to this conference, I was a bit hesitant. Um, and one of the reasons why I was a bit hesitant is because uh, I don't often interact with the non-dual community and I have very specific perceptions of the non-dual community as a community that is kind of checked out. Uh, and that might be true, or, or maybe it is not. Uh, but that was my perception, so I just kind of thought about this, you know, what the heck am I going to talk about? Uh, you know, I mean, most of my work happens on the streets. Most of my work is about helping young people to have a very specific kind of a contemplative experience, an experience in which they can... <coughs> essentially connect with their calling, uh, an experience in which they can allow God to live through them, utilizing all of their talents and, and, and you know, transforming their wounds into something that could become their unique gift to the world, where they can offer whatever it is that I have in service of compassion and justice. And so, you know, when I think about the non-dual community, I'm thinking that all that I just said usually kind of qualifies as this world, which is just an illusion. <laughs> and so, you know, feel free to challenge me if I talk about stuff that uh, feels completely elusive, you know, just throw something at me or whatever. <laughs> you know, we have about, I guess, 35 minutes now. Uh, so I was thinking that maybe I'll just tell you a couple of stories that I kind of woke up with this morning, you know, when I was kind of praying about uh, what the heck am I going to talk about. Um, and there are a couple of stories that are kind of with me right now. Uh, and those stories are stories of finding our calling. Uh, the first story that comes to mind is a few years ago, I was at a Zen Buddhist monastery with a bunch of kids from the streets of New York. In New York City, we have this organization called the Reciprocity Foundation. And we do all kinds of things with, with, with young people from the streets. But one of the things that we do, we take people off the streets and take them into monasteries and allow them to go through this very deep process of contemplative living and healing and uh, you know, dealing with I guess all of the broken parts of themselves, you know, through different contemplative practices and, and different holistic practices and spiritual direction. And I remember going for a walk with this one kid, you know, because he really wanted to have a conversation about his life. And this is a kid who was born with HIV in the 80s. His mom died of AIDS. And so when she died, basically, uh, as a kid, he ended up on the street. There was no one who was willing to take care of him. Uh, and so I met him at a group home for kids who are living with HIV. It took us two years to essentially get to him and to convince him that he too has something within himself, within himself, something worth committing to. And so, you know, at that point he was doing fairly well and he was trying to kind of make a commitment to a life that would make sense to, 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 to him. And so we were going for a walk and he wanted to have this deep conversation about his life. And he was telling me that what he really would like to do with his life, he would essentially like to work with young people who just get diagnosed with HIV. He said, you know, I really want to show them that having this diagnosis is not essentially a, a death sentence. And I want to be an example of someone who can bring hope to them, who can empower them, and et cetera. And you know, my first reaction is always, wow, that's beautiful. I mean, I love when our kids, uh, you know, want to do something that brings healing to the world, right? But at the same time, I wanted to make sure that he's not just doing it because someone told him that that's the only option that he has. Uh, and so I challenged him on it, because I knew that he was also interested in creativity, he was interested in filmmaking, he had all these kinds of crazy ideas about, you know, starting different kinds of enterprises. And so I wanted to make sure that he's not limiting his dreams, so to speak. And so I challenged him 
on it. And, and, and finally, he's like, look, stop right there. And he said, the reason why I want to do this is because every single time I am in front of a group of young people, every single time I get to share my story with the politicians in upstate New York, you know, advocating for better health care for young people with HIV. Every single time I get to mentor someone who was just diagnosed with HIV. He said, every single time I'm able to do it, I feel like there's an angel sitting on my shoulders. And that's how I know that this is what I was born to do with my life. And you know, whether you relate to angels or not, I think that what was very beautiful for me in that story is that he gets to do something and he gets this sense of being infused with life. He gets this sense of being on a wave of something. And it's very clear that this is what he was born to do. This is who he was born to be. And so for me, you know, when we talk about spirituality and when we talk about the contemplative experience, for me, contemplative experience is about that. How can we get into that state of receptivity and listening? How can we be in that space of curious not knowing and just wait patiently for that impulse of God arising in our hearts. And then, how can we build enough courage to say yes to that impulse and begin to live as an expression of that impulse in the world? And so for me, that's what contemplative life is all about. I don't care about flashy experiences. I don't care about non-duality. I don't care about any of that unless it leads to that, where I feel that there is this something that is arising in me, that something that is able to take all of my heartbreaks, all of my, whatever it is that I have, whatever it is that I experienced in my life, and transform it into a unique way of me serving the world. And usually when that happens, when we're in that experience, we just get this sense of being radically alive. And you know, one homeless kid, also on a similar retreat at a, at a, at a Buddhist monastery, um, tried to describe what that experience is like for him. Uh, you know, and he, he, he was talking about it to, 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 to a Buddhist nun and, 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 and to, to two Buddhist nuns, and one of them said, wow, that's like an experience of samadhi that you just had, you know? This is amazing. And then the other nun was like, no, 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 impossible. You can't get it without sitting on a cushion for, for at least 15 years, you know? <laughs> and he said, for him, when he's in that experience, being and doing he said, there's no space between those two things. It's just this something. And Meister Eckhart has this beautiful line uh, where he says, you know, what good is it that Mary gave birth to Christ? You know, I don't know how many, whatever, let's assume 2,000 years ago, I mean, you know, he's not our contemporary, so he said something different. But what good is it that, that, that Mary gave birth to Christ, you know, 2,000 years ago, if you and I don't give birth to God today? And then he said, we are all called to become mothers of God because God is always needing to be born. And so to me, being in this contemplative experience and saying yes to our calling is, is essentially about that. It's about allowing that impulse of God to arise in every single cell of our being. Say yes to it. And then allow it to live through us. Allow God to live through us, utilizing all of our talents everything in service of 
God's dream of compassion, justice, and nonviolence. And so, what I've discovered, you know, how do we get to that experience? Um, and, you know, each of you might have a dif different answer for that, but what I've discovered through my work with young people is that usually people are able to get to that space of receptivity and listening, to that space of trust, to that space of being taken by that impulse of God that is present in each and every one of us. I discovered that usually we get to that place through both paying attention to our heartbreaks and paying attention to our aliveness. And in my life, the way that, you know, it happened, I, I used to be all about, you know, non-duality and wanting to be a Christian sadhu living in India and, you know, being in the Himalayas and I read all the books by all the yogis and, and I ended up going to India to do that and I got to do it for a few months, but what happened to me is that I came in contact with a community of homeless kids and meeting them brought me back from the mountain to the streets. And all of a sudden I discovered that even though, you know, I kind of wished that I would discover God, you know, in some cave or in the Himalayas, I really, because that sounded really cool. You know, especially after reading Ram Das and all of those guys, you know, and like really trying to fashion my life after that. I discovered that I really began experiencing God for the, in any kind of an authentic way in the broken bodies and lives of homeless kids, at first in Delhi and then in the U.S. And I remember one specific experience where I was staying with this community of broken people, that's how they called themselves. It was a Christian ashram located in the slums in Delhi. And the founder, it was my first night there, and the founder of the community said to me, well, you know, now that it's getting late, you have two choices. You can either sleep on the roof or you can sleep in that room. And sleeping in that room means that you're gonna be essentially sharing a room with this guy who has TB, AIDS, and, and cancer, and, and he said, he's probably gonna die within the next day or so, I can already smell it. And you know, I looked at that guy, and it was just a guy, skin and bones, vomiting, blood, and I mean, I've never seen anything like it. My stories of, you know, yogis and amazing realizations didn't prepare me for dealing with something like that. All of a sudden, it's like every single button that I had, you know, was pushed, and I was just on the floor, broken into pieces. And I went to the roof and I was very happy about being able to stay there, but then it started raining and it was monsoon and it rained for three days, so I had to, you know, had no choice. And it took me probably three days to finally decide that I want to come back to that room kind of mentally and actually begin to pay attention to what was happening. And I remember I had this experience where, you know, finally the heartbreak of it all just hit me. And all of a sudden there was this experience of a crack of my identity where the operating system that was kind of running my life, the operating system that was, you know, objectifying that person's pain, the operating system that was trying to convince me to just get the hell out of there and go back home, that cracked. And all of a sudden, there was just this sense of aliveness, this sense of being held. And all of a sudden, that pain that I was witnessing was also my pain. And the only way to respond to that was to move into that community and begin to work with people like that person who was in my room, vomiting blood and all that stuff. And for me, that was the beginning of realizing what contemplative prayer is about. 
you know, I had all kinds of experiences before that, but it's really when I began to work with the poor, when I began to showing up and witnessing their pain and accompanying them into the depths of their pain without any buffers and being there with them and breaking there with them, it's only then that I discovered that every time I'm there, every time I break with them, there's this something that just arises in the midst of us. This beautiful presence that just kind of begins to do the work of healing on both them and me. This beautiful present that just starts picking up the broken pieces from the floor and rearranging them into something that begins to reflect something good. And so again, for me, that's the experience of contemplative life. That's the experience of activism. That's the experience of what I think spirituality is about, um, you know? And, and it happens differently for different people, but it's usually through either an extreme heartbreak or a sense of falling in love or experiencing this aliveness. So I thought that before we have a conversation, maybe it would be nice to just do a few minutes of contemplative prayer, kind of related to our heartbreaks and our aliveness and, and really connecting with what's in our hearts and really connecting to with all of our individual ways of being in the world, all of our individual ways of touching God and bringing God into this world. So if you're down with that, I would love to ask you to sit comfortably. And just close your eyes. Take a couple of deep breaths. And allow the sound of the bell to call you back into your heart. like to ask you to become aware of everything that is alive in you right now. Your pain, your longings, all of your heartbreaks, your dreams, your aspirations. your shame. And just one by one, try to notice each of those feelings, each of those sensations. And try to locate each of them in your body. In other words, where does your pain live in your body? Where does your joy live in your body? What about your stuckness or your longings or whatever else is alive in you right now? Try to locate each of those things in your body. And sometimes it's helpful to touch that part of your body and massage it gently and just simply say, here you are, pain, welcome, welcome. Here you are, so-and-so, welcome, welcome. And as you are becoming aware of all of those things and 
as you locate all of those things in your body, one by one try to bring each of those sensations, each of those feelings into your heart. And you can literally imagine that all of that stuff is slowly traveling into your heart. Knowing that your heart is big enough, that there's enough space there for everything that you just named, for everything that is alive in you right now. And now whenever you're ready, I would like to ask you to put the palms of your hands over your heart. Holding your pain, holding your joy, holding all of those things that are alive in you right now. Holding them with gentleness and care. Holding them just as if you were holding a little baby. With that kind of tenderness with that kind of love. And just spend the next couple of minutes connecting with everything that you're holding, holding all of those things with tenderness and gentleness, literally imagining that you're holding a little baby. And now, whenever you're ready, imagine that just as you are holding all of those bits and pieces of yourself with love and care, imagine that now you're being held by this invisible presence of God, this presence that is always ready to hold you, always ready to love you, always ready to receive you, And you can imagine that your body is like a sponge opening to this presence, absorbing its warmth, allowing this presence to touch all of those dark corners of your heart, infusing it with life. And so how does it feel to be held this way? with that kind of unconditional care. And just literally imagine that every cell of your body is opening to this beautiful and tender care. How does it feel to be held this way? Is there anything that you need to say to this invisible friend? You know, in the Jewish tradition, we are told that it's very helpful to imagine that God is our best friend our best friend who's always there, available to us for a conversation. And so if you're being held right now by this friend of yours who's always available to you, who's always ready to show up for you, what is it that you would like to say to this presence of unconditional support? What's really on your heart right now? You can spend the next minute or so silently speaking to this presence. 
expressing what's on your heart, talking about your heartbreaks, talking about whatever it is that's on your heart right now. And then whenever you're ready, slowly coming back into the room. But not letting go of that awareness of connection, that awareness of being cared for, that awareness of freedom that comes from knowing that we are loved. And so whenever you're ready, you can open your eyes. And so we have about 10 minutes now, which is not much time, but I think I would love to spend this next 10 minutes just having a conversation about <clears throat> what's your reaction to all this? Uh, and I don't just mean an intellectual reaction. You know, you can disagree with my framework or agree with my framework. It doesn't really matter. But what's really here? What's happening here? And is there anything that needs to be said before we go in our own, you know, ways. So I was wondering if there's anyone who would like to respond to all this. Yes. I just felt tears come in my eyes when you told your lofty... I felt tears come in my eyes when you told about your idea of going to the mountains and finding God and then really getting there with this person in the room. I work with addicts and, and psychotic people. And when I was younger and not so old, I wanted to be a missionary. <laughs> I wanted to be a missionary and go do God's work and be all that kind of, same kind of idealism. But the same thing happens to me when I'm doing a therapy group with these very troubled and lonely and abandoned and traumatized persons. And I have had that same experience of reality in my heart. Mm -hmm. That gives me joy and gratitude and energy that's contagious. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's a channel. Mm -hmm. So I, I felt like embracing you when you told your story, because I know what you're talking about, and it's really exquisite. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Hi, Adam. Hi. I just want to thank you, Adam, because you might not feel like you're very non-dual or whatever, category. But I think that what you did was you just invited people to return to their own heart. Mm -hmm. And for me, that's the essence of spirituality. So I think what you, what you shared, and what you shared not only in words, but just by your presence in that little guided meditation, perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I just wanted to kind of reiterate, and, and I am in agreement what you said about you don't have to sit on a, on a cushion for 15 years for this to happen and um, to find out what it is, what your calling is, and uh, maybe kind of invite others to, like for me, it seems like ever since I was young, I knew, but I masked, I, I kind of forgot in a way and got into a different... Um, unconscious lifestyle and it seems like we all kind of know when we're kids in a way what we're supposed to do and so yeah I, I agree with you and I think that you know others can kind of look and what is it that thing that really makes you happy and passionate and that's what I kind of found out it was always there and um, when I had my awakening it, it, it kind of cleared the way for this to, mm -hmm. to, to come to life in a sense so thank you thank you but you know I just want to make something clear. What I'm not saying is that I do think that practice, daily practice is very important. And I don't think that, you know, being in your calling is just about being in a moment. 
I think that it takes a very hard work to build a life based on your calling and that requires daily practice, that requires having a proper framework for spiritual life, that requires being in spiritual direction or working with a spiritual guide, that requires learning the skills that you need to learn in order to truly incarnate your truth in the world. Uh, and yes, for some people, you know, it maybe happens spontaneously, but I haven't met too many people who were able to actually sustain that for, for long periods of time unless they really dedicated themselves to a life that is really kind of like a monastic life in the world where you have a rhythm of life, where you have a rule of life, which I think maybe Matthew is going to talk about uh, that afterwards. I don't know if he will. Uh, this stuff is serious business. I guess that's all I'm saying. It's not just about, you know... Uh, being present and I mean all of that is important but it's it takes a lot of commitment and it usually takes a lot of heartbreak as well because uh, following your calling oftentimes puts you in conflict with you know the institutions that you're part of with you know being able to make a living and all of that stuff okay. I, I just wanted to um, really humbly thank you uh, and I'm, I would like to wash your feet with my tears. Uh, in, t in 2012, I was one of the first physicians and chaplains to arrive at the Newtown shootings in Newtown, Connecticut. Mm -hmm. And uh, I went through three years of a, that brokenheartedness after that experience and um, started a Seeds of Love Foundation uh, working with the street children of Africa, Cameroon and Ivory Coast. And, uh, but after three years, since 2012 to this day, I've been paralyzed in that brokenness. But we're about to begin a project with uh, street children in Ethiopia. Mm -hmm. So I, I just needed to thank you for deciding to come today. And that, that space, that place where uh, Jesus washed the feet of, a, of a, either a prostitute or who we thought or who we judged, that, that space between divinity and action. And I just wanted you to thank, I just want to really thank you for inspiring that in me today. Well, thank you for your kind words and for your work. I think we have room for one last question. Um, one minute left, I'm being told. That's good. Because I'm running out of ideas, you know. So. <laughs> Adam, I'm a, a fairly cerebral person, have never been much of an activist, but in retirement I got involved with our local Occupy, and I know that you've been involved with writing a book uh, with Matthew Fox on Occupy. Mm -hmm. And the, the question I have is that how do we balance the outrage that we feel with the things that are not right in the world? with spiritual principles, non-dual principles, because so much of that outrage comes from a place of judgment. And it's just hard to, to reconcile those two things internally. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, I can tell you what happened. Sorry about that. I can tell you what happened to the kids from Occupy. A lot of them did discover a very unique brand of spirituality uh, where they you know, went to Zakari Park or other places of occupation. They learned how to connect with each other. I mean, one of the direct quotes that we have in the book, you know, kids were talking about learning how to put aside their egos and relate to everyone in such way that wisdom could come through everyone participating in their communities. To me, to be able to do that, it takes contemplative practice. And for them, what happened, it was just, it seemed like it was this kind of a download of grace, you know, a container was created and grace just kind of descended. 
But the difficulty with that is that it wasn't named properly for them. And, 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 and one of the difficulties with that was that a lot of our elders didn't know what the heck was going on. And so as a result, they immediately started criticizing it, saying that, you know, the movement is not good because it doesn't have a strategy. The movement is not good because it's not connected to our churches or our mosques or temples or whatever, right? And so those kids were left on their own. Uh, and they were betrayed both by the conservative establishment and by the liberal establishment. I mean, the liberal establishment was kind of excited about it for the first few weeks, but the moment they realized that this movement is not just about re-electing Obama, they basically checked out and, and, and started criticizing the movement. And so the kids were left on their own. There was a beautiful something happening, and what could have happened is that the elders could have stepped in and begin to enter this kind of a beautiful dialogical relationship that I, for example, have had with Matty Fox, which is reflected in our book, Occupy Spirituality, where instead of just showing up and criticizing, the elders are there to actually listen and connect what they're hearing to their experience, connect what they're hearing to our ancestors, which for Matty Fox, one of his ancestors, is Meister Eckhart, right? I mean, we have all these saints and sages. And then, I think what would have happened is that young people would have been given this kind of what Richard Rohr calls a dangerous permission to trust what's unfolding in their hearts, but at the same time, what's unfolding in their hearts and that experience would have been connected to a solid practice and a solid framework for, for both you know, a contemplative life, but also for a life of activism based on nonviolence. And that didn't necessarily happen. It happened with some, you know, some occupations and some individual people. And so I think that the key for, for all of us, you know, those of us who are committed to a spiritual path, uh, I, I think we have to get active and we have to get involved in all of the struggles that, that move us and not show up as teachers, but show up as listeners. And then eventually, if you are truly bringing something into that community, that community is very open to ask you for advice and for tools that can help that community to go deeper um, and, and to be able to translate their passion into something that could help create a better world. So I think that you know, it really has to start there. Uh, I would also like to point out that there's a new book that's coming out in, in a couple of uh, months by Paul and Mark Engler um, about how uh, nonviolent movements will uh, reshape the 21st century. In my view, it's one of the best articulations on what to do with this energy that, that, that sometimes just kind of happens, you know, uh, and how to translate it into strategic actions uh, that are both kind of rooted in deep moral and ethical principles, but at the same time that can produce results uh, in our world. I think that's all the time that we have. Thank you so much, guys.